Welcome everybody to the Scale Up Show. This is your host, Ryan Staley, and I have a very special guest with me today. I have the CEO of Sparala, Sahil Patel. Sahil actually became the CEO after he was previously a client, um, basically used them, built a company, sold it, and is now running Sparala. Has two daughters, plays soccer, is in a classical muse band. Music band. Why do I keep seeing music band, man? I don't know what the hell my problem is. By the way, it's classic rock. I mean, I love classical music, but it is classic, classic rock. Rock. <laughs> different than classical music. Like, I, I don't know, man. like I, anyways. Let's roll with it, man. <laughs> you you have the classic rock look, too. You got the man bun rocking. You look very, like, dialed in still. So, anyways, happy to have you on the show. <laughs> Ryan, really glad to be here. Yeah. I know it's funny. You're talking to me before. You're like, hey, how many episodes have you done? I'm like, oh, it's like four years, 400. And you're like, you seem like you really know what you're doing. And I basically just destroyed that within the first 30 <laughs> seconds of this. So tell us a little bit about you, man. Like, where are you guys at in the revenue journey? Um, tell us about Sparrow a little bit and some of the cool things that you're doing. Yeah, Spyro, it's it's a really cool business because we get to do something that's super visual, su super fun. And like, everyone has a website. And almost everyone spends a lot of money to get traffic to the site. The reality is 80, sometimes 90% of the people leave the site and don't do anything. It's amazing. Like if you had a restaurant and 100 people walked into the restaurant and all but three left, you would you'd say you have a big problem. And yet every day, and, and I'm, I, most of what we do is B2B websites, business to business, especially SaaS. Generally speaking, B2B websites, that's what's happening. 100 people are coming, 90% of them leave, don't do anything. And it's really expensive to get all that traffic there. And so what we do is help our clients make higher converting websites. We call that conversion rate optimization. It's not a term we coined. People have been doing it forever. And there are some really famous companies. Booking.com is one of them. I think they claim to run like a 1,000 tests every day or some ridiculous number. It's, it's really cool. I'd say only in the last... 10-ish years has that science arrived on the doorstep of, of B2B, the B2B world. And so we are doing what we can to help our clients uh, do conversion rate optimization, CRO. And it's really measurable and it really has a big impact. Most of our clients on average get about 20 to 30% more conversions on their website when they work with us and use our product. Okay. So it makes a lot of sense. Give me an example of like what's a tangible outcome. So that 20 to 30 percent, you don't need to say the customer's name, but like what kind of a revenue increase would that be uh, for someone to have a result like that? Yeah, great question. So the impact that a B2B company might have is they would get 30 percent more people filling in that talk to sales or get a demo request form. Now. A lead, I think we all know, you got to have them, but by themselves, they're not worth much. Mm -hmm. Because are they the good leads? Right. Because if it's coming from a Gmail address, who the hell cares? And if it's from, you know, someone that works at Sahil's Laundromat, but I love laundromats, but if Sahil's Laundromat fills in that form, your enterprise software company is like, okay, this person is not ever going to buy from us. I don't give a shit. Our data shows you can get a 30% lift in form fills from the right people. You can get a 23% lift in qualified leads and a 15% lift in new customers. Yeah. And you can do that in about three months. Yeah. So that that's significant, obviously, if you have the right amount of traffic, you have the other things dialed in. So I could see there being a huge... Huge, huge win on that. So, and and I think um, like there's kind of a lot of different ways you kind of approach it. I love the way that you use pattern recognition, which I want to get in with you in a second. But before I keep like interrupting you, can you give me a real quick backdrop? Are you guys bootstrapped? Are you backed? How big is the team? Would love to hear that. Yeah, we're self-funded. The team is about 145 people. Nice, nice. And so we've built it organically and the kind of, by the way, I've done it both ways. <laughs> if you can make it work, bootstrapping or self-funding has a lot of advantages. Now, usually means it takes you a while to get going, but once you get going, you control your destiny. It's a great place to be. 
So true. Very true. I saw a story about Ariana Huffington when she sold her company. I think she sold for two hundred million originally. Are you talking and, about HuffPo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think when she made she made like three million off it or ten million or something like a morsel compared to it. Right. Um, it's real money. Look, yeah. it's real money well, for the yeah, average that's person. Not that that's a morsel, but compared to the two hundred million exit price, you're like, oh, she killed it. Um, and then there was a bootstrapped founder who sold this company for 30 million, maybe took on small investment, made 27 million off it, right? So real, real interesting case. I think you brought up a really good point there. So talk to us a little bit about like how you kind of approach things organizationally, because I love what you guys are doing with pattern recognition and how you're layering AI into that to do some amazing things at scale. So we'd love to hear that. Yeah, so there's a couple things we're doing where we have baked AI into our into our product. So first is there's 34,000 websites that A/B test somewhere on their site. We crawl, scrape all of them. So if someone who's not a client, I'm gonna pick Smartsheet because I admire them and they do an incredible job not only with their product but with their A/B testing. If they run a test, we know about it. If it wins we can take what we learned and adapt that test for all of our clients. Now, here's the thing. One company runs one test, who cares? It doesn't mean, first of all, it doesn't mean I wanna tell my clients, it doesn't even mean that it's going to work for anyone else. But if we see 10 companies all run the same test, especially if they're in the same space and they converge on an answer, it's what we call a proven winner. Those are the kind of tests I like to run for my clients. But here's the thing, how do you find the proven winners? You certainly can't just open up 10 browser windows every morning and find it. There's thousands and thousands of websites and only some of them are running tests. And how do you know which tests are meaningful? To aggregate thousands of data points, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of data points. That's the kind of thing AI is really good for, which is pattern recognition, finding the noise, the, the signal among all that noise. That's how we use. So that's the first thing we do is we, all these tests are in the public domain, but you gotta find them and then you have to cluster them because just because something worked, I'm going to say, let's say for 10 cybersecurity companies, it doesn't mean it's going to work for 10 uh, HR platforms. By the way, just because it works for one doesn't mean it works for all. Um, and by the way, a test that works on someone's paid landing page, paid traffic, very different characteristics than say organic traffic. So if you, to make a meaningful prediction that ah, to make a meaningful prediction it needs to be relevant to the website and so what we can now do is say hey for a client that's an industry x that's getting this much traffic on a paid landing page where the call to action is a 7 day free trial here are five tests and here's the likelihood they'll win and how much lift you should get from them. That's what allows us to have our very unique pay for performance model. Is that we can actually make a meaningful and say, look, this is how much lift we think we should get you. And if we get it, you pay us. And if we don't, you don't pay. People yeah. like that. Yeah. Well, that's what we do. Something, I mean, that's a truly unique go to market model. And I think it's become going to become more and more required by certain organizations because people are tired of paying for the SaaS. They want to pay for the results. So what's the responsiveness on the, on the customer end? And then like, how did you decide on that as the model that you were going to leverage? Yeah. So let me say, we kind of stumbled our way into it, like a lot of things. <laughs> it took a lot of trial and error. Here's the other, and I'll, I'll kind of weave in how else we use AI. Because most people, when they think A-B testing, they think, oh, I'm going to change the button color. I'm going to run a red button against a blue button. And someone told me the blue button's always going to win. First of all, most of that testing is a giant waste of time, number one, because it just doesn't move the needle. Number two, because someone else, by the way, you could find someone it worked for, has almost no predictive power that it will work for your website. So meek testing, mostly a waste of time. If you want to take and get big wins, you want to take big swings. But the challenge is it's a lot of work. Most marketing teams are running lean, especially these days. They're trying to do a lot with a little. They can barely do what's on their plate, much less take on running lots of A-B tests. The average company, if they're testing at all, when we start working on this, is running about 
one test a month. So they run 10 tests a year. When they work with us, they're going to get about one test a week. So between 40 and 50 tests a year. And the reason we're able to run tests at such high velocity is our product automates a lot of the steps of the creation of the test. Now, not all of it. But there's no substitute. I think we all know AI-based copywriting is not very good. It's, it's robotic. And that's not what connects with an audience. Mm. Um, but what we have found is that, by the way, this is something we've built in-house, is that it can get you 40, 50% of the way there on your first draft really fast. And then where there's the, the, the special know-how, that's what gets it to the finish line. So what that means quantifiably is that we can produce an A-B test in a couple of days that might take uh, one of our clients' in-house teams uh, weeks to get deployed. That makes a lot of sense. You know what you're reminding me of? It's funny. Like th this is what I kind of told you on the pre-show. As I'm going through an episode, like different things will pop in my mind. Have you ever worked with Truebill at all? You heard of Truebill? Truebill. No, I don't. But they sound really cool. So, so basically, it's like a B2C app. And I, I had one of the founders on the show, and that's why I, this is coming up. Um, they grew from like zero to like three billion in like three or four years, right? And basically. They got acquired by Rocket Mortgage, I think. And basically, it's an app where they could look at all the subscriptions that you have on your personal account and then basically get you out of those for the ones you don't want to. By um, It used to be manual what they did, and then they integrated it into it, created a SaaS solution out of it. And so the reason why I'm bringing them up is one of the things I'm like, how did you guys grow so much? And he's like, well, our marketing team was insane. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, they would run like 40 tests at one time. Um, they would have tests on the product side and then they would do the same thing on the marketing side. And I was just like, okay. So anyways, you just like had a, a smart. epiphany reminder of a, like a interview I had from a year and a half ago based on what you're talking about, man. So that, that's why. I'm really cool. Yeah. So um, I'll have to put the, maybe, I don't know, I'll share, I'll share the note with you because he goes through it pretty extensively. Um, you guys would, would probably rip up each other. So anyways, man, so Keep talking. I didn't mean to interrupt you in terms of the pattern recognition because you were you were on a path there as well. So that so the first part is pattern recognition. How do you find the the noise or the signal among all the noise? Then secondly, if you do that and you can make a prediction, how do you execute on the prediction? Use AI to help build and run those tests faster, um, really fast. That's how you get high velocity testing. I think it's a great example. How do you now? The company you just mentioned. I, I don't know if AI was part of that or not. They might have just through brute force put resources on Really smart people, I'm sure, put resources on it. But for the average company, that's not, um, most companies, that's not practical. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had a ton of funding and, and stuff like that. So I don't know how they executed it, but this was this was before the LLM boom. So I think, um, yeah. It, so qu question around that. So like any LLMs that you like leveraging on the product side, or integrating or just develop your own model in-house? Uh, so I want to be clear, no, we, di we didn't necessarily build our own models. Um, you know, no, we have built some tools in-house in terms of um, that, that kind of improve uh, the, the machine learning part of where we um, find the, the noise among the signals and calculate the how likelihood a test is to work for a certain company. That part is is proprietary and in-house. Um, you know, here's what I found is that, and I'll speak to my own personal use case. I, using chat GP, GPT, I found a lot of success in just being able to communicate using fewer words. And mm -hmm. I've found most marketing campaigns, a lot of the problems can be solved just by removing 30 to 50 percent of the words and so i use it all the time i'll i'll write a draft and i'll ask ChatGPT, can you take this and reduce the number of words by half now i still want to put in my voice whatever i'm writing what i'm doing uh but it it shows it shows what is possible right sometimes i add some of the words back in but it's it's really good because ChatGPT is brutal because it doesn't care about your feelings 
it's weird though it tries to be so um so so uh it's a pleaser when you when you're like ah oh, yeah this is terrible rewrite it and it's like oh i'm so sorry uh let me try again <laughs> you know I mean? yes. so, um, yeah they've added some manners to it <laughs> yeah which is funny because most people treat it like crap but like here's one that i would say and then i know we're almost up the time so for this episode but one of the things i've seen go light years ahead in terms of like content creation and copywriting is Claude, but giving it multiple docs to reference. So like one being a style doc, one being a, like a content structure doc, and then having those different components. Yes. And then you can even have like a language doc as well. Like use these phrases or integrate these phrases. And then you stack those together and you start to get really, really good content. I think it's like- It's a great point. It's a great technique. Yeah. yeah. If so, you train it better, usually performs better. Exactly. So, all right. Well, unfortunately, we're up on time for this episode. We're going to have you back again for another one. Um, where can people find you? Where can they find out more about Spiralize? And then we'll, we'll wrap it up from here. Yes. So if you want to hear about Spiralize, Spiralize.com. If you want to learn more about A-B testing or generally kind of my point of view, I post every morning at 7.30 Eastern very short clips, typically 60 to 90 seconds, and an easy to read clip. And I think you'll find it interesting. Excellent, man. Well, yeah. I am going That's to- That's on LinkedIn. Your... Did I say that? I can't remember when I said that. I'll say it one no, more that's... time. Yeah, it's on LinkedIn. Okay, yeah, I post every morning, 7.30 on LinkedIn. Okay, love that, man. Well, so what we're gonna do in the next episode, we're gonna go more into your unique business model, uh, how you're growing the company, things along those lines. Because okay, sounds I think good. You're truly unique. But thanks for being on, Sahil. Uh, it was great seeing you, man. And we'll see you on the next episode. Likewise, Ryan.